everyone and thank you very much for joining us for our virtual pituitary conference. This event is part of our We Are Pituitary campaign, celebrating all those involved within the pituitary community. This is one of our pre-recorded sessions and you can find the full programme and other session information linked in the video description. You can also visit our website pituitary.org.uk forward slash virtual conference to find out more. We are delighted to be offering this event for free, however if you would like to make a contribution you can do so online, by text or over the phone. Please feel free to chat in the comments or on our social media channels and any further questions you may have we will try to answer throughout the week or as soon after the event as we can. This afternoon we have Professor John Neil Price who will be talking to us about Cushing's. He has also answered the brilliant questions that were submitted by the pituitary community. John is a consultant and professor of endocrinology based in Sheffield. He is the chairman of our medical committee and he is also a trustee. We are delighted to have him join us for this event and if you'd like to hear more from John, please check out the general Q&A session that he is running at the end of the week. Thank you very much to John for supporting us. So good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to give this uh, discussion and talk on Cushing. So my name is John Newell Price. Uh, I'm a consultant uh, and professor of endocrinology in Sheffield. And I work at the University of Sheffield uh, and Sheffield uh, NHS Foundation Hospitals uh, Trust. So I am going to give this talk on Cushing's. I'm about to start sharing my screen. And the way that I've structured this is to give an introduction and to talk about Cushing's in general but then to take a number of questions, in fact, all the questions that were sent in uh, by delegates, and I intend and hope that I can uh, answer these as fully as possible, though, of course, it's much harder to do that uh, as we're not uh, in person and, and, and able to have a normal dialogue. So with that, I'll just share my screen um, and uh, start presenting. So here uh, really is um, the talk. And what I'm going to do is to uh, talk about Cushing's in general, uh, and then I'll present about the uh, questions that have been sent in, if you like, in a normal question and answer session. And I would have gathered these questions in, in a normal uh, Pituitary Foundation conference by asking you uh, what you wanted to find out about by the end of the session. But it's really important for me to stress that the my answers to these questions should be regarded as general responses and not specific to your actual case. And the reason for that is that anything, truly anything uh, for which you've got a query about really should be raised uh, with the physicians uh, and the healthcare team who are looking after you. So I thought I'd start by just giving some general introductions. So really the question is, well, what is Cushing's. And it's worth just stating for, for those of you who don't know, Cushing, Harvey Cushing was a neurosurgeon, uh, in fact, uh, and his original description of the first patient uh, with Cushing's, who was termed and called Mini G, was really reported back in 1912. And then it was in around about 1930, 1932, that he then described a series of patients uh, who had the condition that now bears his name. And really what Cushing's syndrome is, it is due to the effects of chronic excess glucocorticoids. Now glucocorticoids are hormones uh, and the ones from within the body are synthesized and secreted from the adrenal gland. And in man, the, the predominant glucocorticoid is cortisol. But of course, you'll recognize that there are many glucocorticoids used in medical practice, such as prednisolone and other quote unquote steroids uh, that are used to treat inflammatory conditions, conditions such as arthritis or inflammatory bowel disease uh, or asthma, these types of conditions. And indeed, there are over 5 million people on steroid medication in the UK alone. Uh, and thus, the commonest reason why someone may develop Cushing's is because they're on high doses or long-term doses of these glucocorticoids. But there's another term that's worth stressing. So Cushing's in uh, due to uh, a cause from within the body is down to excess cortisol. 
And because of that, it's referred to as hypercortisolemia or hypercortisolism. And this is when you have the chronic excess amount of cortisol being secreted from the adrenal gland. The clinical signs that uh, give rise uh, to Cushing's uh, I've listed in, in a sort of schematic diagram here, and they'll be very familiar, of course, uh, to, to the audience. And I list them, but I'm not going to particularly read through them here. But one of the important things to note is that although a constellation of these signs, or many of them within the same person, make it more likely that someone has Cushing's, the difficulty is that actually a lot of these signs and also changes in mood and cognition are very common, but they're also very common or can be very common in patients who do not have Cushing's. So for example, weight gain is incredibly common as we all know, approximately 30% of the population are obese. So that's a poor discriminator in terms of whether someone may have Cushing's. But there are other features that I'm gonna come on to that help and aid us in trying to come to work out what the diagnosis is. And the other thing that makes diagnosis tricky is that the onset can be rapid. And if, when it is rapid and it is florid, uh, it, it is terrible for the patient, but usually easier for the physician to understand and make a diagnosis. So how then, or what do we focus on? What are the sort of features that we, we think about that really help us try and decide where some of the things that we're seeing in a patient are driven by cortisol rather than by some other process. And really those features are down to the more specific effects of cortisol itself. And these can develop over time. And unless we focus on the ones which are really much more likely driven by cortisol rather than any other features, then it may be very hard to discriminate between patients with Cushing's and patients who have, for example, poorly controlled diabetes, some excess weight gain and some high blood pressure. So what do we focus on? Well, what cortisol does is it causes wasting of protein. And that is particularly the case uh, with weakness of the muscles, the skin becomes thin, you get bruising. And as a consequence of the skin thin, you get these wide violaceous striae, um, which can be visible particularly on the abdomen, but can be elsewhere in the body. And you can get this very prominent plethoral redness in the face. So these are all down to signs which are more common due to these more specific effects of cortisol. But there are some other discriminating things that we think about, and particularly if these occur at a young age. So for example, in a patient presenting with high blood pressure at a young age or severe diabetes mellitus at a young age, although of course the problem we have now with uh, obesity in younger children, this is becoming a harder thing to use as a discriminator because type 2, type two diabetes is becoming so common in children. Osteoporosis and vertebral fractures. So for example, a young man in his 20s presenting with vertebral fractures would be very unusual and would raise the spectrum, could this be being driven by cortisol? One may then go back and look to see whether that individual had any other features that would fit with Cushing's. Why vertebral fractures? Well, for reasons we don't fully understand, cortisol and glucocorticoids affect the spine much more uh, than the hip or other long bones. And so it's this, what we call axial skeleton that tends to be affected by excess uh, glucocorticoids or excess steroids. And in children, Cushing's causes two things. First, it does cause weight gain. But secondly, it really stops children from growing. And it is very unusual. In the majority of times when children put on weight, they tend to accelerate their growth. They've got a high state of nutrition. So it's almost pathognomonic if a child is putting on weight but is not growing. And that would really raise the spectrum of Cushing's. And that's a very... Uh, specific sign for Cushing's uh, in the growing child. But this word hypercortisolism is important because a high level of circulating cortisol can be very common. There's lots of conditions where you have a high level of cortisol without having Cushing's, and I list those here. And you'll see that really they can be uh, very common, particularly morbid obesity and particularly poorly controlled diabetes.
And this can complicate interpretation because you will still have biochemical tests which will show a high level of cortisol. And yet the patient does not have a pathological cause underlying this, driving the Cushing's. But there are other times when the cortisol level is high and it should be high. And that is a normal response. So for example, the patient is under extreme physical stress and hospitalization, for example, uh, on the intensive care unit or uh, experiencing a, an infection would normally have and should have a high level of cortisol. So if it just so happens that someone starts doing some measurements of cortisol, one will find the cortisol to be high in those circumstances. So the hypercortisolism of Cushing's is down to an underlying cause driving it. And the commonest underlying cause that I show here in a schematic is due to a tumor in the pituitary gland. So here is a schematic picture of the pituitary gland here, the anterior pituitary gland in this portion, and this is the posterior pituitary gland. The anterior pituitary gland releases a hormone called ACTH or adrenocorticotrophic hormone. That then binds onto cell surface receptors in the adrenal cortex and causes the adrenal glands to make and release cortisol. It's really important to understand that the adrenals themselves don't have any store of cortisol. They make and release cortisol on a minute by minute basis in relation to being stimulated by ACTH. So if there is no ACTH, there is no cortisol. And normally what happens is cortisol will go on to do its many, many different actions throughout the body and then feed back and switch off the production of ACTH in the pituitary. If, however, there is a tumor in the pituitary gland here shown by this purple uh, circle, making lots of ACTH, it drives the adrenals to make lots of cortisol that goes on to give the signs and symptoms of Cushing's. But at the same time, this cortisol feeds back and completely switches off the production of ACTH from the remaining normal pituitary. And I'll come back to that in some later part of this talk in, some, in relation to some of the questions that have been asked. So that's when it's from the pituitary. And because Harvey Cushing's was a pituitary neurosurgeon, this is called Cushing's disease. Whereas the signs and symptoms of Cushing's syndrome may be caused by any other source that drives the Cushing syndrome. And the next one I want to talk about is when you have ACTH being produced by a non-pituitary source. So here I've got a schematic of some lungs with a lung cancer in the lungs that for reasons uh, that no one fully understands can occasionally release ACTH from this lung tissue. And that ACTH will then go and drive the adrenals to make a high level of cortisol to give the Cushing's and also feedback to switch off the pituitary. So you'll notice in this circumstance that there's no ACTH coming from the pituitary, and yet the ACTH measured in the blood will be high because it's coming from the lung. And this is called the ectopic ACTH syndrome. And this is why in patients uh, who present or investigated, when we've got levels of ACTH that are in the blood and they've got Cushing's, we may need to do tests to try and discriminate between whether it's from the pituitary or whether it's from an ectopic source. And one of the tests we do is bilateral inferior petrosa sinus sampling, where we take blood from near the pituitary and work out whether or not the level's higher from the pituitary or higher in the uh, existing circulation, the same in the existing circulation. And the reason for that is because if the uh, blood is or the ACTH is coming from the pituitary, we measure it, there'll be a gradient with a higher level of ACTH in the blood we measure from near the pituitary that gets diluted and will be lower when we measure it in the peripheral circulation. So that's the reason why we use that test to try and help us work out what's going on because often these tumors can be very tiny and also sometimes you don't see any tumors within the pituitary. And finally, you can have direct tumors or hyperplasia of the adrenal gland itself. And this is termed ACTH independent Cushing's 
because it's making the cortisol by itself, not being driven by ACTH, high levels of cortisol, causing the signs and symptoms of Cushing's. But again, the cortisol feeds back and switches off the uh, pituitary gland, therefore there is no ACTH. So those are the three main causes of Cushing's syndrome. And when it's from the pituitary, it's called Cushing's disease. But in terms of the sort of numbers involved, I show this just in a table. Cushing's disease is far and away the most common uh, cause. There's a female to male preponderance. And then you've got around about 10% of patients with ectopic ACTH syndrome. And then for the ACTH independent causes, the majority are due to benign adrenal adenomas. And then there are a variety of much rarer conditions that I list here. Uh, in which uh, we recognize these, but these are really a rare cause uh, of an uncommon disease anyway. And interestingly, this female to male preponderance in adults is actually reversed in prepubertal children. And in fact, in prepubertal children, there is a male preponderance. And this may be telling us something about the influence of hormones such as estrogen uh, on the uh, reason why some people develop Cushing's, we don't fully understand this, uh, but clearly there is something going on that makes it more common in women as adults and more common in boys than in children. And then just to touch on the various tests we use for Cushing, so the first series of tests we use as, and the question we're asking is, is there in someone in whom there are signs and symptoms sufficient to make us want to ask the question, could this patient have Cushing? So in that, when we've got a clinical suspicion, is there hypercortalism? And the three main tests we use are the dexamethasone suppression test, or 24-hour urinary free cortisol, or late night salivary cortisol, or serum cortisol, or those in various combinations. And only once we're absolutely sure that someone has hypercortalism or hypercortisolemia should we then go on to work out what the cause is? Because the problem we have is if, and the difficulty people get into is, if they're not absolutely sure of this bit, and you start going down this line, going to try and work out what the cause, then you can make mistakes. Uh, and there are a whole variety of reasons for that, including incidental findings. So for example, uh, in the pituitary, around about 10% of the population have tiny changes on MRI scans. Uh, which are of no consequence and don't mean anything. But of course, if you're not sure the person's got cushions, you may inadvertently start thinking that that's the source of, of ACTH. But if you haven't established they've got cushions in the first place, uh, then you can get misled by imaging. So it's absolutely essential that we as physicians do this step first and we're happy. And it may mean we have to repeat that test and wait and recheck it and far better that than starting to go down uh, pathways which may lead to misdiagnosis later on if we haven't got this first bit right. And then to find out what the cause, well, we measure plasma ACTH because if that's very low, we look at the adrenal glands. And if ACTH is normal or high, we'd be looking at a pituitary or an ectopic source. And then we have a variety of other tests to help us try and discriminate uh, between a pituitary uh, and an ectopic source, uh, one of which I've mentioned. And then in terms of treatment, uh, and really this is to wrap up the sort of uh, first part of the general introduction, and then I'll go on to the questions. The primary treatment is surgical. So if we find the cause, then the primary main treatment will be to remove that. But we can use medical treatment for any cause of Cushing's, particularly the drugs which block the synthesis of cortisol at the adrenal gland. And indeed, bilateral adrenalectomy is certainly an option for any um, type of ACTH dependent Cushing's, be it pituitary or ectopic, and that's if either the surgery for the Cushing's has not been effective or it's indeed it's not possible. And then specific to Cushing's disease, the pituitary, one may uh, have a discussion about the risks and benefits of pituitary radiotherapy, including stereotactic approaches uh, such as the gamma knife. I think it's important to stress the word knife here, I think, is misleading. It is just a form of radiotherapy. It doesn't cut anything out. It doesn't remove anything. It's just a type of very focused radiotherapy. 
So I'd now like to turn uh, to the questions and go through them and try and answer them as fully as I'm able to uh, each uh, as we go. But I'm gonna read the questions out uh, and then uh, address them in the subsequent slides. So these two questions I've put together because I think they're asking uh, a similar thing. So first question is what causes Cushing's? I already know that cortisol overproduction is caused by a tumor mostly located in the pituitary or adrenals, but why some people get these tumors? And then the next question, I wondered whether there's any evidence that Cushing's of the adrenal gland is hereditary. I've read a couple of things about the MEN1 gene. I have Cushing's syndrome and I'm scheduled for an adrenalectomy on the 1st of February. My sister is 12 years old and I'm displaying symptoms that I had when I was her age. So the question here is, is, is there a genetic cause of Cushing's and or what are the other causes of Cushing's? So there has been quite a lot of work in this area, particularly over the last few years. And one of the big breakthroughs is in pituitary Cushing's disease. Uh, and uh, Martin Ranke, uh, who works in Germany and others uh, in Japan, have discovered that there are mutations in a particular gene called USP8, uh, which in the pituitary itself, there's a change in the tissue in the pituitary. So this isn't a gene that's inherited, it actually it happens in the pituitary, in the cells that make ACTH. A mutation happens, which means that those cells start producing more ACTH. Now, of course, what we don't know is what causes the uh, cells to actually acquire that gene mutation in the first place, but it probably accounts for around about 40% uh, of patients with Cushing's, it's more common in uh, women, it's more common in smaller tumours, but very often there is a more severe disease associated with that. And it is possible that knowledge of this may subsequently lead to some new treatments when we work out the pathways that that gene affects and work out ways in which uh, it may be possible to block its effects. In terms of adrenal adenoma, there are some mutations in a variety of genes, I've listed these here, that can occur in the actual tissue itself, so again, not inherited, uh, that can give rise to adrenal adenoma, so mutations here, uh, a particular gene that affects protein kinase A, uh, is one which is more commonly associated with the benign tumours affecting the adrenal glands. Uh, and I think it's uh, uh, fair to say that the majority of patients presenting with Cushing's will not have a um, hereditary cause for their Cushing's. However, there are some genes which can be inherited. These are known as germline genes. These can be inherited and changes in these genes may mean that you have Cushing's running in families. So there is a very unusual form of Cushing's called bilateral macronodular adrenal hyperplasia. And there's a gene called RMC5 or armadillo repeat 5. And this is a gene which can be affected in family members, can develop Cushing's particularly as they get older. There's another condition, bilateral micronodular adrenal hyperplasia, and that uh, includes uh, conditions where you have a particular condition called Carney complex. And there's a variety of genes that can cause that, and this can run in family. Uh, the question uh, we just had was asked about MEN1, so that's multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1. Yes, in multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1, you can get Cushing's disease. It's not so common, but you can. And yes, you can get adrenal adenomas in MEN1. You also get uh, typically uh, parathyroid disease with a high level of calcium, and also uh, you can get neuroendocrine tumors, particularly of the pancreas but the vast majority of patients with an adrenal adenoma will not have MEN1. In MEN1, most patients, by the time they're 40, will have a high level of calcium because of hyperparathyroidism. So if someone is presenting, for example, in their 50s or 60s with an adrenal adenoma causing Cushing's and they, the serum calcium level is completely normal and there's no family history, really it makes it very, very unlikely indeed that they've got MEN1. Conversely, if someone is presenting when they're young and there's a family history of calcium problems or other problems, for example, the adrenal or the pituitary, then I think it's very much worth thinking possibly 
of conditions like any in one. But this is the sort of thing which should be uh, discussed uh, with the team looking after patients if that's a question. So here's the, uh, the next question I want to address, and it's, it's a big and really important question, and I'll read it out. How do you think awareness of cushions can be improved so that patients get diagnosed more quickly? In my case, and I've been told this is not unusual, diagnosis took over 10 years. That was despite multiple GP visits with many of the classic symptoms, high blood pressure, weight gain, full and red face, bruising, persistent infections, palpations, and feeling stressed and numerous hospital investigation and visits too, including a couple of unusual fractures, one of which needed surgery. After all that, it was more of a chance happening in the end when a hospital doctor, not an endocrinologist, looked through my records, recognized the symptoms and referred me directly. So very sorry to hear that it took that long. Of course, it shouldn't take that long. Uh, it's a bit unusual to take as long as 10 years. Uh, and the average uh, delay in diagnosis is usually uh, between two to three years, but, but 10 years is a possibility. It's, it's unusual to take that long. But you're absolutely right. How can we make this better? Well, the Pituitary Foundation uh, has awareness uh, campaigns for Cushing's. Uh, many of us go and give talks to a whole variety of um, physicians, not just endocrinologists. Uh, we te teach it all to the medical students uh, and uh, we teach it when we discuss things with GPs, etc. But the real problem is, as I alluded to in my opening slides, many of the individual features are common in the general population. It's only when they come together in the same individual does it then make the penny drop in terms of the diagnosis. And that's not trying to excuse uh, the physicians who may not have recognized this in the first place, but it is just a fact that Cushing's itself is not common, uh, whereas all of these other conditions can be common. But you're right, with high blood pressure, weight gain, full red face, bruising, infections, these are all features of protein wasting uh, with the, uh, and also you've got immunosuppression with infections and then the unusual fractures needing surgery. All those things together uh, should stimulate people's minds to have Cushing's. We've got a lot, a lot of work to do, haven't got the full answer, uh, but can say that we are trying to make sure that more people know about Cushing's. Next question, is there a connection with Prozac being taken by a mum during pregnancy and a son's diagnosis of Cushing's at age 17. And the good news to this question is absolutely none that I am aware of. Um, if the mother needed to take the Prozac uh, when she was pregnant, um, then she needed to take the Prozac when, when she was pregnant. There's nothing that I have ever heard about or known about to suggest that that in any way would uh, relate to a subsequent diagnosis of, of Cushing's uh, in, in, a, in an offspring or a child. And a Cushing's presenting age 17 isn't such an unusual age for Cushing's uh, to, to present. So um, really, I think that the reassurance here should be that the answer is no. There, there really isn't a connection between being on Prozac uh, and a son or a daughter uh, presenting with Cushing's at any point in their life. What is the link between steroid cream use and Cushing. So this is an important question uh, because the word steroid here in common parlance uh, really is relating to glucocorticoids, so the glucocorticoids uh, which act like cortisol. And so I'll show a cartoon which I, I hope will explain this. So here again on the left-hand side, we've got the pituitary. And when you're on steroid medication, that be that creams or tablets or inhalers, if that's at high dose, or if it's at lower doses in a patient who's on some medication which prevents the, job, the, the body from removing the steroid drug or metabolizing that steroid drug, then you can develop Cushing's if you've been on it for long enough. And there are some very, very potent topical creams that will do that. If you're on a tablet, then the same sort of thing can happen. And in fact, even if you're on some inhalers for asthma, if you're on some other drugs, so for example, some of the drugs that are used to treat HIV 
really prevent the um, metabolism of the steroid used to treat asthma and patients can become profoundly cushing, so develop profound cushions, even when they're on inhalers for asthma because the body is absorbing it but not able to get rid of it and therefore there's lots of uh, excess glucocorticoid around and can cause cushions. So the steroid cream can do this, but what happens at the same time is it feeds back and it switches off the pituitary. And because it switches off the pituitary, there's no ACTH. And because there's a, a no ACTH, there is no cortisol. So first thing is that physicians should be taking a careful drug history to ask about this. But the second thing is that when faced with someone who's got a cushionoid appearance, if this is what's driving it and you measure cortisol, you'll have the paradox that the cortisol level will actually be low. And so in fact, it's usually not such a difficult thing to work out what's going on, firstly, by just taking a careful drug history, uh, but secondly, measuring cortisol in that circumstance. The only time that that is a problem is if someone is on huge amounts of exogenous hydrocortisone. So hydrocortisone is cortisol, it's the same thing. So if someone's taking an awful lot of hydrocortisone, it's possible to develop the signs and symptoms of Cushing's. And of course, cortisol level will be um, uh, high or at least detectable. But under those circumstances, you'll still have a low ACTH, but the adrenal glands themselves will look either normal or atrophied. And that would be unusual and really would make you scratch your head. So in most circumstances, in exogenous glucocorticoids uh, presenting with Cushing's, it's easier for at least physicians to try and work out uh, what's going on. But that's why steroid medication is the high levels in excess over a long period of time are associated with Cushing's. How much does the contraceptive pill affect the overnight dexamethasone suppression test? I know for some medications, there is a new suppression range of 80 nanomoles per liter. Would it be the same for oral contraceptives? So the first thing I'd say is, I don't think there is a new uh, suppression range. That's not a suppression range that I'm familiar with. Uh, we would still recommend the use of the 50 nanomolar cutoff. Why does the oral contraceptive pill uh, affect it? Well, it's worth just revising how the dexamethasone suppression test works and then looking at how we measure cortisol to answer this question. So here we have the normal situation of the pituitary gland making ACTH, driving the adrenals to make cortisol, which normally feeds back to switch off its own production in this classic feedback loop, which is regulated. If one gives dexamethasone, so this is a synthetic glucocorticoid, that switches off the pituitary, you switch off ACTH. And because you switch off ACTH, you switch off cortisol. And therefore, when you measure cortisol, it's low. And the cutoff should be 50 nanomoles per liter in healthy people. In fact, in healthy people, it's often significantly lower than 50 nanomoles per liter, often down to 20 or 30 or even unrecordable. And the reason why the pill is a problem is what the pill does is it makes this test unreliable. And any form of estrogen makes the test unreliable and needs to be stopped for around about six weeks. So that begs the question, why? Well, the reason I'll show in the next slide. So here is how we measure cortisol in the blood. So I've shown schematically here, if you like, a, a sort of a, a test tube. And here is some blood. And here I've got in purple a thing called cortisol binding globulin. And this is a protein that is within the blood that's in free circulation. And what it does is it carries cortisol around, shown as this red triangle. So you've got cortisol binding globulin and you've got cortisol. Some of the cortisol is bound up and some of it is free. When we measure cortisol, we're measuring all the stuff that's bound and the stuff that's free. That's what the blood tests do. But what estrogens in the pill does is it increases the cortisol binding globulin or mop up some of the cortisol, but you'll still be left with approximately the same amount of free cortisol. But when you measure this, it looks like there's much more cortisol. 
And so if someone is on estrogen, most commonly the oral contraceptive pill, and you do a dexamethasone suppression test, you may not find the level of cortisol going so low. And in that circumstance, you may think, oh gosh, this person could have Cushing's, but in fact, it's a false positive, which is why these tests should not be used in patients on the oral contraceptive pill. You can use other tests such as salivary cortisol or other tests such as urinary free cortisol or stop the estrogen. I hope that explains it. It's all down to the fact that this cortisol binding globulin increases and we measure everything, both the bound and the free. There really isn't a way to discriminate uh, in routine laboratories between the two. I would like to know if there's any research being done to find a solution to the fatigue and also how to stop the muscles being fatigued if there is already information. For context, I'm currently in remission from Cushing's disease, having had my tumor removed about three years ago. My muscles get fatigued and I get tired easily, I don't know if this is true or not. I heard that a buildup of fatty acid in the muscle causes the fatigue. I was told to exercise with weights. This I found does not help much, not that I could manage much. I was told to use tins of food to do this. I used 200 gram tins and I struggled. So uh, I'm, I am afraid to say that this is a very common experience uh, that patients uh, with Cushing's frequently uh, describe uh, weakness in the muscles. And the reason for that is down to the protein catabolism, and that can last a long time. So we've discussed how long it may take for Cushing's to be diagnosed, often quite a number of years. And during that period of time, there is uh, muscle breakdown and problems with the muscles. So it takes a long time for all that to be repaired. Is there any research on this? The answer is yes. Um, so here are some data that were published only a couple of months ago. It doesn't ask the question of what to do, but it is some of the earlier data to look at this systematically. So we have recognized for years and years in clinical practice that because cortisol causes breakdown of protein, you get the muscle weakness. And we counsel patients that very often this weakness lasts for months or years, even after remission. Again, this is data from Munich. Uh, and this is a chair rising test. This is number of seconds. So the more seconds it takes, the slower the rise. And at baseline, when the patient's got active Cushing's, but then six months after the Cushing being treated, there is an improvement, but then it really plateaus. It does improve a bit, but it, it, it rather uh, plateaus. And the reciprocal of that is shown on the right-hand graph here. So this is the, the, the first part of a systemic study being done to work out and document what is going on in terms of people's muscle strength. Of course, the question then is, is why? Is it uh, down to the cortisol or other things affected? For example, cortisol suppresses growth hormone secretion and growth hormone deficiencies associated with muscle weakness. Could it be that that would help? Those studies have yet to be done. And there are studies have yet to be done as to whether um, active uh, and um, graduated physiotherapy may help. But uh, the person who wrote in this question, uh, yes, you may find it and you will find it very frustrating that uh, getting muscle strength back can be a real problem and it can last months or years, sometimes several years. Eventually, uh, people often find that it does improve, but uh, the data here would suggest that uh, really Quite a lot of the patients uh, are still affected some years later. We don't yet know what active things we can recommend to uh, improve on this. Uh, when I see patients, uh, I, I just let them know this will happen. If they're able to exercise, that's great, but not to beat themselves up if they find that actually the exercising doesn't help things and, and, and doesn't make a big difference. And really, I'm afraid at the moment, it's a matter of time. Keeping as active as is, is possible to do uh, but unfortunately, time until we come up with more answers. And you're absolutely right. We need more answers. It's a real problem. Can Cushing's cause any problems during pregnancy? Well, the first thing to say is that if someone has active Cushing's, uh, it's actually quite difficult usually to get pregnant. But yes, active Cushing's, usually, if you've got active Cushing's, it's a good idea to avoid getting pregnant, even though it will be harder uh, to become pregnant. And the reason for that is that there are some significant complications, both for the mother and the baby with blood pressure, diabetes, and other problems. Uh, 
Cushing's occasionally actually occurs when someone is pregnant. In fact, it's more usually down to the, the adrenal glands than the pituitary glands in that circumstance. But it can be very challenging to make the diagnosis because pregnancy is a state of hypercortisism. So I'm trying to tease out whether what you're seeing is down to underlying Cushing's of some description or whether it's just down to the pregnancy can be quite hard. And medical therapy can be used, but it, it's not licensed. There are a variety of different medical treatments that can be used if, if someone does have Cushing's during pregnancy. And they appear to be in the main safe, but nevertheless, it certainly is a challenging condition. You need some very expert care uh, for that to uh, be delivered. So a couple of long questions here and quite detailed questions, uh, and I hope I'll be able to, to answer these. So I'll read them out. How can a synacthin test, a synacthin stands for synthetic ACTH, show that additional ACTH is produced when prompted by CRH to then stimulate additional cortisol secretion? Wouldn't it only show the adrenal glands are responding to ACTH and there is a cortisol reserve if triggered by ACTH? Basically, how can we conclusively test that the pituitary part of the HP axis is working when under additional stress post pituitary surgery for Cushing's in patients who are not on steroid, um, uh, steroids and have ACTH levels in the range and a random 9 a.m. blood test and yet feel as though their body doesn't respond to the stress as it should? So this question I feel is really asking, how is it that a test which is being driving the adrenal glands can give you information about what's going on at the level of the pituitary. Very fair question, I show I'll answer. And the second part of this question is, well, you know, I'm told my test is all right, but I don't feel right. Uh, and I'll come back to that. And then the next question is, I was diagnosed with Cushing's in March 2013 and had surgery in August 2013. I was on full replacement hydrocortisone for three and a half years, after which my body started to produce cortisol and I no longer take hydrocortisone. I'm now seven years post-op with my cortisol increasing but not resulting in Cushing's. My endocrinologist advised against me removing my medical alert bracelet, which states I need hydrocortisone because she is unsure of how my body would react in an emergency. My question is, if I were to get ill, should I be following the sick bay rules and take hydrocortisone? As I don't take anything, would it take, as I don't take anything, would I take 20 milligram daily to cover the sickness period or not? So just addressing the last part of that second question first, you should do whatever your endocrinologist has advised you. If there is absolute normality of your testing, your early morning cortisol and your synacrine test, et cetera, and you're otherwise well, and your axis for every reason looks normal, then I would question whether it is necessary that your endocrinologist may have a reason from the testing that they've done to suggest that you should still have this available. In terms of the sick day rules, you should follow the standard sick day rules. And yes, taking 20 milligrams daily uh, will be uh, sufficient um, if you've been advised to do that. But don't forget, if your tests are okay, your body should be responding. So I think this is something which you should take up with your endocrinologist and it will really hinge a little bit as to how confident uh, then you are that your normal HPA axis is functioning. And this comes back to the second part of the first question, which is, you know, I don't feel quite right, yet I'm told my test is okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just go through some of why the Snackman test is used, and then I'll come back to these questions at, at the end. But first, let's just turn to pituitary surgery. So really there are three main possible outcomes after pituitary surgery. Here's the pituitary, here is the tumor that's been removed shown this dotted line and because it's been removed and because the rest of the pituitary is switched off because of this feedback of cortisol there is no ACTH when there is no ACTH there is no cortisol and this remaining pituitary can be switched off and can be switched off for months or sometimes some years and take a while to recover if you've got partial success you have the neurosurgeon go in there but they've left a tiny slither a little bit of the tumor and the ACTH is still, we can still see that. And as a consequence, there's still a bit of cortisol after the operation. And, and unfortunately, quite a few of these people then go on to get a relapse. And of course, there's a time when with the best uh, will in the world, the pituitary surgeon is, has had an operation done, but unfortunately, the ACTH and cortisol values are still high. And under this circumstance, they'll still have their cushions. So really, I want to focus on the success. So when the operation has been a success, 
really the prevailing level of ACTH would have been switched off. But first, I'll just take you back to this diagram of how the normal HP axis is set up. So you've got the pituitary releasing the ACTH, driving the adrenals to release cortisol, which feeds back to the pituitary. And you also got corticotrophin releasing hormone, driving the uh, release of the ACTH from the pituitary itself. When you have had a successful operation, the pituitary, the remaining cells, which don't release ACTH. And because there's no ACTH around, the adrenal glands, which need the ACTH to remain their normal size and function, actually get small. And after about six weeks, they start to shrivel and they continue to atrophy and get smaller uh, for a period of time. And because of that, because you've not got the ACTH drive, the cortisol values will be either undetectable or very, very low indeed. As time goes on, you can do tests. So in this circumstance, you do the, the synaptin test. So ACTH drives the adrenal glands to release cortisol, but because the adrenal glands are not working, because they're atrophy, because they've not, if you like, seen enough ACTH, they're smaller and they're not as well responsible. You need the adrenal glands to see ACTH um, repeatedly, and then they'll grow up. So in those circumstances, you'll do a synaptin test and you will not pass the synaptin test. Your morning cortisol level will be low and you won't uh, pass the synaptin test. A few months later, or perhaps even a year or so later, actually some of the pituitary has started to wake up again and more ACTH is in the background being produced more but not as much as normal and as a consequence the adrenal glands are larger but not back to their normal size and as a consequence cortisol is more detectable but it's rather being very low it's low under those circumstances the morning cortisol value will be probably quite a lot higher but not completely normal and then maybe a partial response to the synaptin test but you'll see here what's happening is that under the influence of more ACTH coming from the pituitary, the adrenal glands are starting to pick up and they will then respond to the synaptin that's given. And then finally, months to years later, there's been enough ACTH as the pituitary is fully uh, releasing ACTH, the adrenals are back to the normal state and cortisol is normal, you would give synaptin and then that responds normally to release the cortisol. So the synaptin test has got nothing to do with the CRH. It doesn't make CRH release. If you like, it's just uh, asking the questions is, are the adrenal glands able to respond? And the adrenal glands will only be able to respond if they have been um, stimulated uh, constantly enough by ACTH. And if that's been low because the pituitary has been suppressed, the adrenal gland size will have diminished. And as the pituitary wakes up, and the reason why it stays asleep, we don't fully understand, then the adrenal glands will start to increase and you'll respond to synaptin. So this is how you can use synaptin, which is much easier than some other tests, such as the insulin tolerance test, which do cause the release uh, and stimulation directly from up here to drive ACTH from the pituitary, and then you measure cortisol. And that, if you like, was the quote unquote gold standard. But in clinical practice, in most circumstances, the synaptin test is very reliable. Just go back to this question here as well. You know, essentially, I'm not feeling so good. I think this is what the patient, the, 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 the question is asking. The, the random cortisol levels are okay, but I don't feel as if I should respond. So in these circumstances, in my practice at least, it is the early morning cortisol value rather than the cortisol value after synaptin that uh, I'm more interested in. The reason I say that is because the dose of synaptin we give is much, much higher ACTH stimulation than you get from the pituitary. So it's possible to respond to a synaptin test and yet not have a normal response to the amount of ACTH coming from the pituitary. So in the circumstance where someone looks like they responded on a synaptin test, but they tell me that they don't feel uh, right and their morning cortisol levels are still uh, on the somewhat low side, they I would still regard as not having a normal access. I'd be watching and waiting uh, and making sure they're provided with hydrocortisone at times that they need it. And this may well be where the endocrinologist here has recommended uh, for this individual 
that they at least have access to hydrocortisone. So the synaclin test is not perfect. It needs to be interpreted. Uh, no test is perfect. The gold standard is the insulin tolerance test, but it's not in uh, nearly as widespread use as it was uh, even 10 years ago. And if used carefully and appropriately, uh, and if it's interpreted in the context of how patients are, I think the synaclin test is usually a, a very good test. I was diagnosed with Cushing's disease one year ago. This is a, 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 another question, I think the final question. As a result of ACTH pituitary, pituitary gland tumor, I noticed shortly after my surgery, my very curly hair began to gradually become straighter and straighter. It was established by my endocrinologist that this mass was probably present for 15 to 20 years. It was about 15 years ago that my straight hair became curly. How is this possible? My endocrinologist has seen this before. So I think this is <clears throat> a very interesting observation. Uh, it, it's not, in my experience, uh, necessarily so common. So the first thing to say is a period of 15 to 20 years of having Cushing's to a diagnosis, that, would, that really would be pretty unusual. I mean, it's not, of course, it's not impossible, but it would be, I, I think, unusual. But let's turn to the, the hair itself. So. In patients with active Cushing's, uh, the, the complaint often, particularly in women, is you may actually lose your hair uh, on, your, on your head. Uh, but curly hair in humans is not, not so well described. However, it's very, very well described in horses. So here's a horse with Cushing's with this extraordinary appearance of all this curly hair. And uh, both equine in horses and canine in dogs, Cushing's is really quite common, far, far more common than in humans. And in fact, it's due to uh, a different part of the pituitary called the intermediate lobe, which humans don't have. Uh, and that then also responds to medical treatment quite well. So this is the typical appearance of a horse with Cushing's and they get what's called laminitis. So they get thinning and infection uh, of the hooves here. Uh, and that can be a reflection of the degradation of the um, structure of the hoof uh, and infection. So, it's not something which is very common, the curly hair in humans that I'm aware of, but absolutely I can, can conceive that that really would be uh, something that may happen and may well explain the symptoms of the person who's posed the question. But certainly it's very well described, uh, as I say, uh, but not in human Cushing's. So in summary, and just before closing, uh, Cushing's can be really tricky to diagnose. When you experience that, people experience that, uh, it, it, but it can be, and it and it and isn't. It isn't because people are not trying to diagnose it. It is just very, very tricky. Arguably, one of the trickiest things in the whole of endocrinology that we get asked to do. Active awareness and education; these are being undertaken. I think we've got a lot more work to do, and it remains a, a really major problem uh, for patients uh, and uh, healthcare teams. There are new genes being discovered and they relate to Cushing's and it may well be that that can lead to some new treatments and that'd be very exciting going forward, but I would estimate that'll be many, many years uh, down, the, down the line. And I think it's worth stating again that Cushing's due to steroid medication is far and away the most common cause of Cushing's. But the test we use for Cushing's uh, all have pitfalls, they all need to be very carefully interpreted and there's no such thing as a perfect test and therefore that's where uh, the people doing the test really need to understand the, the pros and cons of all the tests and how to interpret them. And then finally and unfortunately the effects of Cushing's last a very long time, uh, really long time both physical and mental effects uh, even after full remission and other than um, listening uh, to patients and warning about it. Unfortunately, at the moment, we haven't got great interventions that can, can necessarily fix that other than time. And time can make a huge difference to many people, but unfortunately, some people are still left with some pretty significant difficulties, even though they are in long-term remission. Uh, and so with that, I will uh, stop sharing my screen. Uh, it's been a pleasure for me to give this talk. Uh, I hope that it was useful. Uh, and with that, uh, I wish you a very good time and look forward to times where we can actually meet up uh, in person and take questions and give answers in person. All the best.